Hi, my name is William Stokes, and today I'll be talking about globalization and the video game industry. So, the video game industry has been growing quickly over the past few decades, but contrary to popular belief, it is not a new industry or it, it is not or an industry reserved to only the United States and Japan. In fact, it's quickly becoming apparent that, vi that video games are quickly becoming one of the fastest expanding entertainment industries. And as the technology would make them possible, becomes more readily available, the more and more this industry expands globally. There's a tendency to also think of video games as entertainment experiences um, and not as actual material products. When it comes to globalization and video games, um, many people only think about the cultural aspects like the expansion of esports or the fact that you may very well be playing a game with somebody in another country. But not that many pe people think about that globalization is an economic force just as much as it is cultural, which is why the games industry is, itself is a current topic of critique. Beginning with the basic history and then the growth of the industry and then talking about the industry has, has become globalized and some of the criticisms made against it as it adopts the same policies as many other transnational corporations. So starting out, video games existed essentially since the invention of computers, like tic-tac-toe was made to run on like a on a like a room-sized computer in the 50s. Eventually, um, like arcade games and like tiny, uh, like small computer games entered the picture. At this period, most of the, um, of the manufacturing of these games came from the United States, France, and Japan. Eventually, later on, uh, consoles enter the picture, like PlayStation, um, Xbox, uh, Nintendo consoles, um, but still mainly dominated by these three countries. Where this changes is as we enter the 21st century, um, gaming becomes more and more dominated by personal computers or PCs, and more and more game companies be become, uh, begin sprouting up. These companies are from across North America, South America, Europe, and South Asia. This is largely because of the resources used to make uh, games like high-performance PCs and software used to develop video games became more widely available. For example, the game engine Unity. Game engines are, found, are foundational software for video games. It runs animations, AI, game physics, it renders textures, basically everything that makes up a game. And Unity is one of these amazing uh, uh, engines that is among dozens of these online softwares available entirely for free. The accessibility to these resources ultimately is what helps solidify the games industry as a global force. Now, just like providing people with a technology doesn't make an industry uh, explode overnight, but it does increase the number of people with a skill set required for the industry. Um, and just like any other transnational uh, uh, market, um, the video game industry is not opposed to outsourcing for contractors worldwide. These contracts um, are becoming standard in the video game industry, and they've been compared to Adidas sweatshops, um, which may seem like an exaggeration. But when but when we look at about at the actual experience of people that worked in these contracts, um, it involves eighty to one hundred hour work weeks, uh, very little. Pay pay considering the product that they're making is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, no benefits, no severance packages, no vacation time, The con and the contract ends as soon as the game is finished. It is textbook worker exploitation under neoliberalism. And it's made possible because, partially because working in video games is basically a dream job for a huge amount of people throughout two generations now. Um, and these companies know that and they're willing to exploit these people. Um, the physical disc of the games also reflects transnational connections. For example, I have a co copy of The Last of Us Part 2. It is a game developed and created by Naughty Dog, which is owned by PlayStation, which is an international company. Um, and PlayStation is owned by Sony, which is a Japanese country. It is distributed by Sony Interactive Entertainment, which is also owned by Sony, which is a Japanese company. And this disc in the box itself was um, created by Sony Dadzi, another subsidiary of Sony. Sony Dadzi is international. There's two locations in the United States. Um, actually, most discs that were created in the United States are from one of these two locations. Um, after it was created, it was shipped off to a GameStop where I got it. What all of this reveals is the ways in which transnational corporate monopolies are extremely prevalent in the video game industry. Essentially, basically every game that is not explicitly from an indie uh, developer was mostly created by one of just a handful of companies. Even most indie games rely on these companies if they want to see widespread distribution. For example, Minecraft was an indie game made in Sweden by just a few people.
but the rights to it were recently bought by Microsoft, which is a media conglomerate just as large as Sony. Another example is the game Stardew Valley uh, for the uh, for the PlayStation 4. Stardew Valley is an indie game, kind of a classic indie game, originally made by just one man in his spare time. It reached massive success when published independently online, so naturally console distribution came next. While the game itself was made by just one American man, um, it was distributed by 505 Games. This company is Italian, and while it's far from being the mega conglomerate of gaming publishers like Sony and Microsoft, it is still a multi-billion dollar company, which represents the international nature of the video game industry. Now, as discussed before, video games are a form of culture. In France, they're even considered a legal form of art, not just entertainment. And um, when it comes to the, the fusion of culture and uh, and economics, it is susceptible to cultural homogeny in style. In the 2010 paper on international uh, homogeny in architecture and under neoliberalism, researchers Kathy Payne and Paul Knox argue that the relatively few cities that hold the biggest stake in the global market have all adopted the same uniform architectural style. It stated, seeking to ensure that flagship projects have a symbolic aesthetic of up-to-dateness, officials allow and even demand a modern appearance, however appropriate it may be, which is a statement that can be easily applied to the video game industry when we look at the, at the style of most AAA games. So a AAA game is a multi-million dollar game. Think of Call of Duty, Skyrim, uh, Assassin's Creed, FIFA, 2K, most like sports games made by EA, and that's just a handful among hundreds. They all, if you look, they all share the same uniform style, just like architecture, um, and this style is one of hyper-realism. So just like the architecture of buildings in Dubai mirror the architecture of buildings in London, games made in Mexico mirror the same style of a game made in Korea. There's also, like, some subtle nuances and differences, but it, it, but it is largely homogenous, partially because of what is described by Payne and Knox. The style is adopted across borders to assert itself as a quality game. Same as cities adopt the same style to assert itself as being worthy of financial importance. In conclusion, the video game industry is a highly globalized industry which shares the same flaws as any other transnational market under neoliberalism. This is made possible by the rapid availability of technology used to create games, as well as the influence of huge media monopolies and their willingness to outsource labor. The industry has also shown the effects of cultural homogeny and erasure of unique style reflecting the culture of origin. In short, video games aren't just entertainment experience, experiences, but they actually reflect the material reality of neoliberalism and globalization. Thank you.